All right, everybody, welcome back to the House Government Operations and Affairs Committee. Um, we're here this afternoon um, to hear a uh, walkthrough of the Senate proposal of amendment to H270. Thanks for being with us, Michelle. So good afternoon, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And um, because this has not yet passed the Senate, you'll be taking a look at the Senate Economic Development uh, Committee strike all amendment that you should have, um, else as well as an individual instance of amendment from Senate Finance, and then Senate Appropriations voted it out without amendment. So I'm going to first just walk you through the Senate Economic Development Amendment, and I'm just going to focus on the changes. So going to the first change is on page two. Oops, sorry. Page three, sorry. Um, so there is a new section three that was added. This was requested by the Cannabis Control Board. Um, this is just a technical amendment. So this is amending the language for the cannabis regulation funds. So remember, that's the fund where all of your licensing fees, application fees and such go into. And for FY24 and 25, you're having excise tax money go there too to, because the fees are not covering everything in terms of the rollout. Um, and this is just a technical amendment you'll see on line 16 and 17 is that it just refers to currently that it's the monies from the fees um, from the cannabis establishments, the adult use market that goes in there, but it's actually supposed to be for the medical registry and the dispensaries as well. And so I think that that was just an oversight at some point. So that's just a technical. The next change is on page five, section five. And so this is amending the section uh, with regard to regulation by local government. And there's just some clarifying language that has been added. And if you look at page um, six, uh, there's two things that this is doing. Um, in subsection C, you'll see that prior, it says that prior to issuing a license to a cannabis establishment, the board has to ensure that the applicant has obtained a local control license from the municipality if that's required. And the new language adds, unless the board finds that the municipality has exceeded its authority under this section. So municipalities have very limited authorities with regard to regulation of the um, of, of a licensed cannabis establishments that's, that is regulated by the board. Um, and that's already set forth in statute and that this is not changing it with respect to that. However, you'll see there's some language um, that has been added to clarify in subsection D where it says in current law municipalities shall not prohibit the operation of a cannabis establishment when, within the municipality through an ordinance or a bylaw. And that was adopted in 2020 um, when, you did, when you set up the adult use system. And the idea was that when you enumerated the um, things that a municipality could do, you wanted, you wanted to clearly set forth in statute that uh, it was not within their purview to essentially prohibit these establishments if they met the requirements under state law and could be licensed under state law. And um, what uh, the board has seen, and they can speak to this a little more, is that while um, some towns may not be putting it directly um, in their local laws to say these types of businesses are, are prohibited. They are um, creating uh, requirements within their bylaws or ordinances that effectively prohibit them. So if you're creating such a high bar that they can't meet that, um, then it's kind of enforcing, effect. it's having the effect of banning them without specifically saying that they're prohibited within the municipality. Um, and I think the board can talk to you if you want to talk to you a little bit more about that. So I so subdivision D1 in that added language is just a clarification of the existing language, because 
That wasn't that D1 originally the intent was that it, not just that you can't say specifically in your ordinance cannabis establishment is prohibited. It's that you can't through the use of your ordinances and bylaws effectually prohibit them through creating such restrictive bylaws and ordinances that they can't comply. Representative. Um, who's the ultimate authority in deciding whether or not that is the case or that's been done? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second half. Um, who's the ultimate authority in deciding whether or not that has happened in this case? Well, this is so there's two layers. So if the local if the local municipality decides to regulate within what they're allowed to do under current law, um, then the the licensee would have to get whatever local license or permits at the local level. And then right now, the way that it is, is that the board CCB would have to ensure that they've obtained any required local permits before they issue the state permit. And what this is doing is saying that um, that the board up in subsection C is that if the board determines that the municipality has exceeded its authority under the statute and has gone beyond what they are permitted to do under statute, then the board can go ahead and issue the state license. So that really takes the some zoning authority away from town that they currently have or probably could. I mean, I think this is section is not changing their authority, so it's not changing what they can do. It's just saying that, um, and you know, I don't want to. It might be best if you want to talk, perhaps, to the board about what they're seeing and um, and the concern about whether or not some municipalities are complying with the spirit of the law currently. questions about this. I think these questions about the um, municipal control are tricky because we're saying that like a liquor control board, the uh, municipalities can have cannabis control, but what we're really saying here doesn't really have to do with that. It's about the, the use of their ordinances and bylaws to just make it impossible for exactly. So if you created such a high bar that nobody, so if you said you have to have a two hundred foot setback, you can't have any odor at all at the property line. If you like, if you say you can't, you if you if they create such a burden on there that it's essentially impossible to run a cannabis business and comply with those provisions and the the um, and you're effectively um, prohibiting them through having such onerous provisions, then, <clears throat> then the the uh, that's not allowed under D, um, under existing law with that clarification. And then in subsection C, if the, the board finds that the municipality has exceeded its authority in what it can do, like if it's um, perhaps uh, adopted something that says, you know, there's certain putting certain requirements that they're not that they don't have authority under this provision of state law to do, then the fact that they didn't get a local license at the um, is not going to prevent them from getting a state license if the board feels as though they've ex exceeded their authority under statute. That's very clear. Questions about that from the committee? <laughs> So next section is section six, and this was added to the Senate Economic Development Amendment at the recommendation of Senate Agriculture. Um, so last year, the General Assembly provided certain benefits to small cultivators, so cultivators of 1,000 square feet or less, um, and they get certain um, benefits of farming without getting the whole panoply of benefits. And what section six does is it uh, expands that to apply to all outdoor cultivators. And so if you look at page eight, um, you'll see the language um, on subsection F 
right now it's limited to small cultivators, um, uh, but that is striking the word small, but it still is only applying to outdoor cultivators, not to indoor cultivators. Um, and so you'll see the benefits on page nine um, around ability to enroll in current use. Something that's changed there is that under current law, the land already has to be enrolled in current use. That wouldn't apply um, if, if this language passed. Um, uh, they wouldn't be regulated by municipal bylaw um, in the same manner that uh, RAPs are not regulated by municipal bylaw. Um, they'd be regulated in the same manner as farming. Um, so they'd be exempt from Act 250. Um, and then also they get certain sales tax benefits. Um, and then you'll see in subdivision five, uh, they're, they're entitled to a rebuttable presumption that cultivation doesn't create a nuisance under the right to farm law. Um, there is a fiscal note on this. Uh, I don't know if Andrea has, has a link to that, but you can um, probably find that either on um, House, I mean, Senate Appropriations or Senate Finance um, website and link to that for folks. <laughs> so the testimony was that um, by increasing it from small cultivators to include all outdoor cultivators, <laughs> excuse me, that um, it would be an increase of about eight additional acres statewide. So it's relatively small. Eight. <laughs> yes, sorry. And I have allergies. I'm not coughing COVID on you all. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so that's um, that provision. And so that was the recommendation of Senate Agriculture. Um, and it's a Senate Economic Development accepted that amendment. I will tell the committee while we're on this section, I spoke to Chair Kornheis, Chair Durkee, and Chair Sheldon, who all signaled that they were comfortable with this game. <laughs> number of acreage of uh, outdoor grow and that Representative Sheldon brought up in a conversation that it might actually encourage people to be out to grow outdoor instead of having you know energy intensive indoor. I don't know if that's really the case, but it's at least one and one benefit is that it just gets treated as agriculture in the way that most other crops that people grow. <coughs> Treated. Okay, so next changes are on page 13, and this is in the accessibility of records for the CCB. And there were just a couple technical amendments that's an economic development made in consultation with, um, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna remember their name, but the public records person at the secretary, <laughs> I don't remember the name, the new name of the, I'm sure y'all do hear from her, Tanya. Sorry. I, uh, Tanya Marshall. Tanya Marshall. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say straight archivist, but isn't it a different name now for the office or something? But um, so they worked with her because she wanted to just tweak the language. So you'll see that there's new language in subsection D. E. Um, that uh, is just the way in terms that we phrase that uh, <clears throat> that the record is confidential or not. And so it's just been changed to shall be available for public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. But there's no policy changes in here from what, uh, from what you passed out. Sorry. Page 15, section 12, this is just a new section um, identifying the time period for the implementation of the new propagation license. Uh, so you remember that you added a new propagation, kind of a nursery license category. And this is just saying that, <coughs> excuse me, the board has to issue those on or before July 1st of next year. Okay, next changes are gonna be in your medical section. So there are some changes that um, were made to section 954 with regard to caregivers. 
Um, it's going on page 20, and I didn't highlight anything on there. But um, what you had on caregivers, remember, you're changing from a fingerprint supported CIC check to a Vermont um, conviction record. Thank you. <laughs> um, and a check of both of the protection registries, the child abuse and the adult protection registry. And um, you directed both of those agencies to adopt rules for how they would release those records to the CCB, but there's already statutes in Title 33 already for who they can release those records to. So instead, we've taken out the provision around rules <coughs> and directed them to release those records. <coughs> So that's in section 954. <coughs> you have a new subsection E. That's just a statement of the way that it is currently, <coughs> which is that Medicaid funds are not to be used to support caregivers. I'm going to have to get a glass of water. <laughs> we, we can take a break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, Michelle, go ahead and get a chat, please. I got actually. <laughs> I, I have a, um, a couple of questions I would ask Chair Pepper if he's willing to, to jump in while, while we lost Michelle. Yeah. When you do this? I was about to stand up and jump right in. Yeah. In one community. <laughs> uh, she's not getting better. She's not getting better. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, for the record, uh, James Pepper, Chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, I'm happy to answer a question or pick up where Michelle left off. Um, the, the amended language um, in this medical section was a request of DCF and Dale. They're authorized to share records with certain people by statute, and they just wanted us to be added to that list of people that they can share records with. The original language said that they had to come up with rules in order to share, and they didn't want to have to go through an extensive rulemaking process. Um, so you just added a statutory provision that allows them to share these abuse and neglect registry results and the um, child sexual exploitation results as well with the cannabis board. You know, I, um, it's good to have you back, Chair Pepper. Um, been a few weeks since we were on this while the Senate was working on this bill. Um, I was going to ask specifically to going back to um, the biggest change here policy wise is the, um, the ad language. And so I just was going to ask for kind of the um, board's position on that. So, uh, you know, it, we supported the Ag Amendment. Um, we were neutral on whether Act 250 should apply to outdoor cultivation. Um, we really think that that's a policy choice for you know the legislature to decide. Um, you know, it, it will certainly allow existing farmers to use their existing farm equipment um, and their existing farm structures uh, to um, cultivate cannabis. Um, and kind of narrow. So I think it is in line with the intent of the bill, which is to support small local farmers. Um, and so, but, you know, we don't know, you know, we're not 250 experts, so we don't know the full scope of what that could do, but it was determined by both agriculture committees, I think, uh, to, to the outdoor cultivation should be exempt from 250. Um, with respect to um, the question around, does the changes here, um, you know, the ability for the board to issue a license, um, even if we don't have all local permits. Um, really, it's a very narrow set of circumstances where we would be allowed to do that. And it's really if we find that a ordinance that was passed locally had the effect of prohibiting cannabis, cannabis cultivation within their municipal borders. Um, and, you know, you wrote in the original legislation that municipalities cannot do this, but we're seeing that they're finding clever ways of making generally applicable ordinances that have the effect of prohibiting cannabis cultivation within their borders. And the odor was a, was a good one. You could say no odor at the border of, you know, at any property line. Um, that sounds like a generally applicable, that it would apply to all agricultural odors. But in fact, you know, because of the right to farm exemptions, it only applies to cannabis. So, and then even, even further than that, it only applies to high THC cannabis because it doesn't apply to hemp, which is the same point. 
So really, um, I think that amendment is in line with the intent of what you guys passed, you know, in 2020, Act 164. Any questions for Pepper about those pieces? Representative Waters Evans. Thank you. I just have one question about what you just said. So the difference in THC in a plant would not affect smell in any way. I would say no. I mean, maybe it's slightly more pungent if it's above that 0.3%, but really a, a hemp plant and a high THC, a low THC hemp plant is flowering when it reaches that 0.3%. So the odor is present uh, at that point. And then, you know, maybe it's present at a higher level potentially, at, you know, if you're growing at 15% THC. But, um, you know, we're talking about maybe like a very short window, you know, when it's growing, maturing from 0.3% to 15%. Complicated, you know, but it I, is. Yes. But just a, a normal person driving by couldn't tell the difference. No. Okay, thank you. Um, the medical section made um, the, the the Senate made a, so a couple of substantive amendments to the medical um, that you know we asked for people with, that are that are on the medical registry with incurable or lifelong conditions like. MS or Parkinson's, you'd only reapply for their medical card once every five years as opposed to annually. Um, and again, doctors, you know, healthcare professionals that are signing the form are just attesting that they, this is a patient in their care and they have this condition, not recommending cannabis, not prescribing cannabis. They're just verifying that that condition exists in the patient that's in their care. Um, the Senate felt that that should be reduced to once every three years as opposed to once every five years. So the annual, it won't be an annual, it'll be once every three year renewal as opposed to what this committee passed, which is once every five years. Um, and then they asked for a report back on the medical program. Um, you know, I think there was some, they heard a lot of the same testimony you did around, are, the, are these the right qualifying conditions? Are they not? Is, you know, should there, is there any information about dosing, proper dosing, or kind of people's tolerances to cannabis, specialty products that certain <laughs> types of conditions may benefit from? They wrapped all that into a report and asked us to come back uh, with recommendations about the future of the medical program. All right, so it sounds like the fear of what we had put in there is kind of remaining, but the, the knockdown five years, three on the registration for those particular patients with chronic and lifelong conditions. Right. All right. Um, I wanted to ask <laughs> the line um, where I think this is where uh, Michelle was just getting to around the main function not being used to support. That's the way it is now, right? Are we just kind of like putting a finer point on it? Yes. Okay. They don't request it. Okay. Yeah. Wanted it to be very clear, <laughs> but no, that's not a substantive change in policy at all. Yeah. Any other questions about that piece? That one popped out at me. What is that? <laughs> so I think James took you down through the report that Senate Health and Welfare recommended to Senate Economic Development, and then it takes you down to sections 22 and 23. Um, and these were hidden in hand with the Senate Finance Amendments, which is, uh, add sections 23A and 23. And this goes to um, and trying to solve, hopefully once and for all, the decoupling of cannabis and tobacco in statute. So I think we talked about it a little bit uh, earlier in the year. In the BAA, there was language that was clarifying that um, for tax purposes, Big cartridges that contain cannabis oil are not to be considered a tobacco substitute and taxed at the tobacco rate. So when the adult use market was set up in 2020, um, there was very clear intent that cannabis taxes were over here. There's 14% excise tax with a 6% sales tax, and that's to be applied to cannabis and cannabis products. 
and that was, and then there was no discussion of applying the tobacco taxes to cannabis as well. But because of some of the definitions that are embedded in tobacco laws, there was some people could read into that that they that somehow cannabis might have been looped in there. And so what you have in section 22 is an amendment to the definition of tobacco substitute. Uh, to clarify that tobacco uh, substitute does not include cannabis products. Um, you have something similar in section 23, which is that other tobacco products um, as well does not include cannabis products. And then for your uh, Senate Finance Amendment, along the same line, section 23A um, it's amending the definition of cannabis product to clarify that cannabis products don't mean tobacco products or tobacco substitutes or tobacco paraphernalia. It also um, uh, clarifies that uh, cannabis product does include any device designed to deliver cannabis to the body through inhalation of vapor that's sold at a cannabis establishment. That is to address like like uh, the devices that aren't like vapes where they're where you're using a cannabis oil in a cartridge, but to use something um, like tax, which is to burn flour instead. And so it's just, these are just, uh, I think, clarification, technical clarifications uh, in accordance with what the original intent of the General Assembly was. <laughs> and I think they're just, uh, at the time, obviously, nobody was talking about tobacco, so I think it didn't even occur to us that you could read into the tobacco laws to, to think that they would apply to cannabis. I would just add that, you know, if a cannabis retail establishment wants to sell tobacco, in addition to selling tobacco paraphernalia, you know, they have to get the tobacco license. This applies to a subset of people that want to sell, that are a can licensed cannabis establishment that are under our jurisdiction, that want to sell cannabis delivery <laughs> devices, can cannabis paraphernalia, and no tobacco. So we don't want to create an incentive, which the current law requires, for these folks that are selling pipes, because again, we have 13 million tourists that visit Vermont every <laughs> year. Some number of them are going to cannabis establishments. They, they don't have any way to kind of consume cannabis. Uh, you know, if they're selling a pipe, they need, under current law, they need to get a tobacco license, and they can also sell cigarettes and tobacco products. We want to eliminate that incentive for them to also sell cigarettes. And this language, this, this policy was in the bill that you passed, but it just took a little bit of clarification um, with the tax department and the Department of Health and liquor and lottery and, and the administration to make sure we weren't jeopardizing, we weren't messing around with anything that might jeopardize federal funding. And so the 23B section that's added in the Senate Finance Amendment is essentially replacing Section 14 of what you passed, which was the language just trying to say that, you know, you don't have, if you are a licensed cannabis establishment and you're not selling tobacco products, you don't need to get a DLL license. And through, as James mentioned, there were a lot of conversations between Lodge Council, CCP, Department of Tax, Health Department, DLL, about trying to get this language right, make sure everybody was on the same page, and it was really clear. So if you look at the Senate um, uh, Finance Amendment, and you look at Section 23B, it just says very specifically in there, I think the new edition of H, that um, it doesn't apply to a cannabis establishment who's, that is licensed. Um, to engage in retail sale of cannabis products, um, but not engage in the sale of tobacco products or tobacco sales. So if there was a cannabis establishment that chose to also sell e-cigs or things like that, then you need to get a DL license. But if they're just selling cannabis and cannabis products, they do not need a DL So we've removed the incentive for a retailer that is really just trying to sell cannabis and products and cannabis paraphernalia, if there's any overlap between the use of that paraphernalia for cannabis and tobacco, they don't have to get a tobacco license if they're only selling cannabis and that particular product. Okay. That is what our intention was, <laughs> as I recall. Um, so it sounds like we, uh, are all of those, did all of those stakeholders, Chair Pepper, kind of buy in to that Senate Finance Amendment, or is there? Yes, I mean, I've got emails from all of them. They uh, just signing off, you know, 
Charles Martin from DOL and Skyler from DOL and David Englander and you know, Monica Hutt. And all of them have signed off on the language and, and Will, Will Baker, the general counsel from the uh, tax department. So they're all on the record with me. Um, <laughs> all right, great. You know, if, if we've been talking about this with them because of the implication of the tax since September or later of last year. Um, so we've been been trying to narrow this language in it just takes time to coordinate with that many different agencies. Um, are there any sections that we didn't hit at all? One more. One more. Oh, because now we're because we went off into the finance amendment. All right. And that's section 24 of the economic development. <laughs> and so that is transferring half a million dollars from the campus regulation fund, which is your fund that is made up of fees, but for FY24, 24, 24, 25, it's also going to be made up of the excise tax. And so it's moving $500,000 from the regulation fund to the campus business development fund, which is to be used for social equity applicants. And then transferring five hundred thousand um, dollars out of the campus business development fund to the agency of commerce and community development to fund So you recall that when the, again, when the legislation was created, there was an original five hundred thousand dollar appropriation. There was also um, a fee there for integrated licenses to go into that fund, um, to the evolving loan fund. And, and so this is one-time money, um, and uh, because the excise tax will be going to this fund, uh, it should be for those two years. It should. So the the funding source for both of these half a million dollar appropriations is the excise tax. Well, there's a it's combined. So generally, that campus regulation fund is just made up of application fees, licensing fees. But because the fees have not been able to carry out all the work of the board as you're building up the agency and adding compliance officers and all of these other things is that um, the General Assembly has already um, designated that the excise, 14% excise taxes that would normally go to the general fund for FY24 and 25 are gonna be going into the cannabis regulation fund. So for two years, the tax money plus all the fees will be in that fund. And so it's all stirred up together. So, but it's just, you know, it's not taking it, um, you know, the board is short if it's just from the fees normally, and so you're adding the extra money going there. So you could say it's really just coming from the general fund because you're diverting that excise tax for two years from the general fund to the to the campus regulation fund anyway. Yeah, I think that the, the conversations I had with Chair Wood and others, uh, so the committee is aware, uh, is the you know the anticipation of being able to use more revenues from the sale of cannabis um, for the prevention purposes and, and other things that, the, that many folks in this building are interested in. But I think the board needs to be able to stand up the <laughs> new market in order to realize that revenue hope. So um, if this is, facilitates that, it sounds like that's... Right, well, the the... Money going, the excise tax being going into that fund is that's already that's just yeah. Folks have questions about that. Both um, our colleagues and uh, you know, other committees are going to be looking at the dollars flowing, so I'm less concerned about that than to hear. But. Great. Well, any other questions for Chair Pepper and Michelle about the words on the page? I think um, this is on notice today. So I don't know if it has a rule suspension or when it's coming to us exactly, but I wanted to make sure because it, there were so many changes that we had a little time. Ago. Um, 
No, no, no. It's the, It's on their consent. Yeah, so they haven't actually. It's been through so many committees now that they haven't moved it along. So I anticipate getting it before we adjourn. But... Hmm. Clock's, clock's ticking. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you for walking us through this. I appreciate it. Do you anticipate uh, any other amendments? Well, Bryn actually just noticed something, uh, you know, the propagation license, and this is actually, it, it, it is somewhat substantive, so you may want to hear about it. <laughs> you know, in Acts 164, you created six license types, uh, cultivation, you know, product manufacturing, retail, wholesale, um, and uh, a um, integrated license, right? And um, you said, uh, you know, there shall be six license types. And then we created a propagation license. Um, so now there's actually going to be seven license types. Um, and the reason why this is relevant is because you also said no one can have more than one of each type. So you can't stack, you can't, you know, one company can't buy six cultivation, you know, 30,000 foot cultivation licenses and have, essentially have, you know, however much that is, that much cultivation. So if a propagate, the, the idea behind a propagation was to allow, um, a, to allow a cultivator to have clean tested source material, to have, to be able to kind of purchase clones from a cultivator, from a propagator, and know that those clones that they purchase have been subject to all of the CCB regulations around testing and microbials and mycotoxins and everything else. So then the question then becomes, do you want cultivators to be allowed to get a propagation license as well? If, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a type of cultivation license, then they wouldn't be allowed to get both because they're only allowed one of each type of license. So if, if you create a seventh license type, identify it as a seventh license type, then a cultivator would be allowed to get a propagation license in addition to the cultivator. You know, it's a little bit, it's very nuanced because of the way our system is set up. This one license per entity rule is the first of its kind. No other states do this. Um, so you have to kind of have that as your framework when you think about can a cultivator, it's a licensed cultivator, also apply for and get a propagation license. And this definition of there shall be six license types means that if we don't change that to seven, that means that a propagator will have to be considered a cultivator. And then you'll have propagators that are not allowed to also cultivate. So will there be an opportunity to have that included? Right. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, so that's, it sounds like a floor amendment for the Senate. I think, but, but this wouldn't it just be a technical amendment, which is just saying that there's a seven type of license? Or are, you, or are you guys saying that maybe it should be? Well, well, Bryn just raised it with me when we were sitting here, so I, I don't know. Right. I would see it as like we just should have added saying that there's seven licenses. Instead of yes, just an Add to the add to the list of six and then change the right. password. I mean, I think unless you have a unless you have some clear policy reason why you wouldn't want someone who's a cultivator to also have a nursery license, then I think this is just a technical saying that because we added a seventh license and there's a few little cross references. And Brent and I had talked earlier in the year about making sure that we got all the cross references. Yeah, just because there's no policy reason not to allow that. I would I would say no, but you know, this is a very prescriptive area of the law. So, Representative Hango. Would that um, mean that somebody could have more plants, more, not more square footage, but more plants? It would be more square footage, but they're not allowed to. So they, your cultivation license, and you know, the, the largest tier that's open right now, I think it's 10,000 square feet. You could get a... 3,500 square foot cultivation license or propagation license, but those plants have to be sold or you know moved to the market once they flap, start to flower. Um, so you can't just say, can't just say I now have 13,500 square feet of canopy. 
you know, a portion of that canopy has to be for immature you know, juvenile plants that, um, that then you could sell to other cultivators or to retail. And, and the propagation license itself, that those are all, you know, none of those are mature plants. So it is more plants because you could make more revenue off it by selling those 3,500 acres or whatever it is. Right, yeah, and I think, you know, just, I'm sure I'll get, angry emails about this, but you know, the, the, the cost of a clone, depending on how big it is and how, how long you've cultivated it, it could be anywhere from like eight to $30 for a clone. Um, and then like the price, the pound of, you know, harvested cannabis is significantly more than that. This is, this is really trying to allow people that are really good at making clones, provide clones for the entire industry so that people can, you know, just like you would buy a tomato start instead of growing from seed, you know, you just purchase a, a plant that's already in the works. So shouldn't we then limit cultivators from not being able to be propagators also? I think that, I know it's a policy yeah, decision, I mean, but that's where my mind is going. Yeah. Yes. Well, that would probably defeat the entire purpose of having a propagator license in, in practice, wouldn't it? You know, it might, it might not be a viable business type. But originally, when we suggested a nursery license, we said that the cannabis should be unlimited because of the relative cost price of a start seedling clone versus finished flower. And so it's a really... Um, you know, 3,500 square feet, you know, you might be able to be a viable business type with just that, but really I think this is kind of an add, an add on to the cultivation. But again, it, I, uh, I leave it to it's the committee that created this market really like, you know, gave us the direction to give us direction on this. Well, we, um, we have some things that are coming up that we'll have to switch gears to, um, and we have some more time on this. I wasn't expecting the committee to take a position, but um, I thought while we had some time in our schedule before things get too hairy at the end here, I wanted to at least see what the Senate was proposing to us and start sparking the conversation. So I think we've done that admirably. <laughs> I, I will, I would just say one, one last thing, if you don't mind. Um, you know, our largest license site, um, you know, the 10,000 square feet, because we voted to close our 15,000 square foot license, um, is a tier two out of 11 in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts, the largest license type is 100,000 square feet. So, you know, it's always, I think, important to keep the scale of what we're doing in Vermont. And I, and I would also mention that 77% of our cultivators are 1,000 square feet or less. So the vast majority of our market is being driven by people growing, you know, plots the size of these tables you know um it's, that's a very important piece of what we're doing differently in vermont compared to any other state well uh thank you michelle thank you chair pepper uh we will probably come back to this once we uh see more progress on this bill in the senate so thanks for giving us a preview of coming attractions uh i want to switch gears here and take up H291, um, which is coming right up for us. Totally correct about where we are in process, but um, Becky, if you want to take the chair to walk us through the Senate's changes to our Cybersecurity Council bill. So this is, um, on the notice calendar today. So this will be up for action tomorrow. Unless we got our rules to take it up for some reason. Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. I did um, send a side by side comparison of the two bills that might be posted on your web page. So that might be the easiest thing to look at. Okay. 
Do you wanna want me to wait for you all to find it or should I start that? Got it. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great. Um so the Senate proposal of amendment made um, a few changes, as you can see in the side by side from the House passed version. Um, so I'll just start with uh, section one, which is adding um, the new chapter on cybersecurity in Title 20. So I've, I've separated out the side by side into um, into sections of the, the new sections that were added in that chapter. So starting with section one in um, the new section 4661, the definitions, the change from the House passed version of this bill is that there is a definition added in the Senate for essential supply chains. And as you uh, may recall from this bill that one of the, um, that this, this definition is used throughout because the council is um, looking at the impact of, of cybersecurity on um, essential si supply chain businesses. So the Senate added a definition to refer back to for that. And the definition that uh, it's used, was added here is supply chains for the production in sufficient quantities of the following articles. So there's medical supplies, medicines, and personal protective equipment articles essential to the operation, manufacture, supply, service, or maintenance of critical infrastructure, articles critical to infrastructure construction after natural or man-made disaster, articles that are critical to the state's food systems, including food supplies for individuals and household and livestock feed, as well as articles that are critical to the state's thermal system and fuels. And then there is another section that was added in the bill later on that relates back to um, possibly amending this definition, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in a moment. So then um, in section one still, in section, the new section 4662, which is creating the advisory council, there was just a, a small change made in the Senate to the purpose of the council. So the uh, change is that the council's purpose is to advise, um, in addition to what was in the House's bill, on best practices, communication protocols, and training um, with respect to cybersecurity infrastructure. Uh, then the next big change is in subsection B of this section with respect to the membership of the council. So uh, the bill that came out of uh, your committee had um, a House and a Senate member on this committee, and the Senate removed the legislative members of the committee. They also made a few changes to the other to the membership, um, the other members of the committee. So first, um, the, your version of the bill had a representative on the council that uh, was from a state electrical public utility appointed by the governor. And this was changed to a representative from a state electric, electrical public utility, sorry, to, to a distri distribution or transmission utility appointed by the Commissioner of Public Safety. The um, appointing authority for the representative. Did they mean the Commissioner of Public Safety or did they mean public service? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, it is public service okay. and it's a mistake on my side by side. Oh, okay, but I didn't miss that because I'm yes. side by side. Right. Yes, I will crush that. That happens all the time. It's both DPS and everything. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Peggy. Yeah. Um, thanks for noticing it. <laughs> um, so, the okay, the next change is to the appointing authority from the for the representative of a state municipal water system. So, that was changed from your version to be the uh, Secretary of Natural Resources. With respect to the representative from uh, a Vermont hospital, the Senate removed um, or an accountable care organization, and they also changed the appointing authority to the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And for the person representing a Vermont business related to an essential supply chain, the appointing authority was changed to the chair of the Vermont Business Roundtable. And in the next 
um, subsection in this section, subsection C, <laughs> the powers and duties of the council. Um, so one of the big changes which we'll get to is that your version of the bill had the Cybersecurity Council um, creating uh, standards for critical infrastructure domains. The Senate has taken out that section, which means they, that um, in this powers and duties of the council, they have struck out the power and duty to review and approve those standards because they will no longer be um, tasked with creating them. There is a change to um, a small change to the language asking them to evaluate statewide cybersecurity readiness um, and develop and share best practices for policies and procedures. And then um, the Senate also added here, so this is on page three of their uh, amendment. The, a new subdivision uh, for the council to conduct an inventory and review of cybersecurity standards and protocols for critical sector infrastructures and make recommendations on whether improved or additional standards and protocols are necessary. And so this new um, responsibility is sort of taking the place of the section in your bill that had them coming up with the, the cybersecurity standards. And then two more changes were made to their responsibility to um, identify and advise on certain opportunities. So first, um, with respect to um, the state investigating ways they can implement a unified cybersecurity communications and response, they added in some clarifying language to say this would include recommendations for establishing statewide communication protocols in the event of a cybersecurity incident. And then they also added in a, a new subdivision on investigating access to cyber insurance, including how to increase availability and affordability of um, that insurance for critical industries. Any questions? Um, the next change is in the meetings section and subsection F. So if you're following along in the amendment, that's on page five. Um, so the, there is a strikeout of um, subdivision F1, which in your bill ha appointed the, the CIO as the chair of the council. And this was struck out just because it was um, duplicative in the membership section of, of this section is that that individual is named as the chair. So it was just repetitive language. And then a new subdivision F3 was added in their bill. And this is speaking to um, the authority of this council to enter into executive session and what um, matters they were allowed to consider that would you know, allow them to go into executive session. Um, so, the, uh, it says that in addition to 1 VSA 313, which is the statutory provision that allows um, for public bodies to enter into executive session if they're considering certain matters, this council is author also authorized to enter into an executive session to consider additional types of testimony. So. First is testimony from a person regarding details of a cybersecurity incident or response to that incident, the disclosure, disclosure of which would jeopardize public safety, or any evaluations, recommendations, or discussions of cybersecurity standards, protocols, and incident responses, the disclosure of which would jeopardize public safety. Uh, and then there's a uh, new language in there that also says that members of the council and persons invited to testify before the council shall not disclose to the public information records, discussions, and opinions stated in connection to the council's work if the disclosure would jeopardize public safety. I think this um, new subdivision is just getting at the fact that the reasons under statute that you can enter into executive session might not um, cover all of the um, reasons why this particular council would need to um, keep information confidential with, you know, in, in doing their work. Subsection G, so this is on page six of the proposal of amendment, 
is the reporting requirement. Um, so the Senate changed um, what would come back in the report. So in the House version of the bill, the report that would come to the legislature would be on information acquired pursuant to activities required under their, the powers and duties of the council. And the language in the Senate bill is that the report back would be a, a status update on the work of the council. I think this was also trying to get at um, making sure that um, they didn't want to disclose all information acquired during the work of the council because some of that might be confidential. Section, um, subsection H in your version of the bill uh, was the compensation and reimbursement provision that was uh, back to subsection I in the Senate version because a new subsection H was added. And this has to do with a Public Records Act exemption. So this is um, saying that any record or information produced or acquired by the council regarding cybersecurity standards, protocols, and incidents responses, if that disclosure would jeopardize public safety, will be confidential and, and exempt from public inspection or copying under the Vermont Public Records Act. And there is language that um, says that this exemption shall continue and is not subject to the uh, repeal review. And the new subsection I is just the compensation and reimbursement for the members of the council. The change here is that since there are no longer legislative members on the on the council, there's that language about um, legislative compensation and reimbursement was, was removed. And then finally, in still in section one in, in 20 VSA for in the new 20 VSA 4663, um, this was the section in your in your version of the bill that required the council to review and approve cybersecurity standards for critical infrastructure. And as I mentioned, they, the Senate struck out that section entirely from the bill. Okay. Um, Representative Chase, that's the first one that sort of strikes me as maybe really uh, changing the Yeah, that's kind of half the point of the bill, but um... <laughs> It, I, I want to talk with the uh, Scott Cardi um, and get his interpretation of that um, in chatting with the Senate side. It sounds like um, they were getting an awful lot of pushback from businesses that didn't want additional uh, layers of that they have to abide by. Um, and it sounds like the way they structured the, um, the, the inventory and is it the, it's an inventory and review. Yeah. Would, uh, is intended to create a plan that everybody could move forward with together. Um, but at, at, at this point, it at least establishes the council, which is a start. Um, I, I have some feelings about it, but. <laughs> Just from a scheduling standpoint, since this is up for action tomorrow, do you want to wait to take a position on it? Or, I mean, I, I, I kind of want to pull the committee once we get through this. I mean, the Senate made a lot of changes. They had. They heard different testimony than we did, and they, they had some different feelings, I think. Yeah. Um, this is on the, uh, we'll, we'll, it'll be on the floor tomorrow, right? Yeah, so, I mean, we could, we could spend a little time on this tomorrow before we get out on the floor or push it till later in the day. And yeah, if we can do that, that'll give me a little time to uh, catch up with Sean and Scott. Representative Do you know if there was any rationale for pulling legislators off of this? Uh, I can, I don't want to speak for the Senate committee, so they can, um, if, you know, they can speak to that in more detail. But I, I think the, the stated reason and committee that I heard was that um, they wanted uh, People with expertise on this committee, and because there was such sensitive information being discussed, uh, they wanted to kind of 
limit the, the membership to those who have expertise in this particular area. Representative <laughs> I, this is one of those instances where uh, I, I had talks with my Senecap counterpart um, and th this thing came up and their position over in Seneca Labs was that this isn't the kind of council that legislators should be on. And my advocacy on behalf of our committee's position was that we know how fast cybersecurity and technology issues are advancing and the ability to have a legislator at the table who could then come back with all the knowledge of those conversations to share in this room, in these rooms here over in the General Assembly as we need to you know, adapt. I would say this is one of those policy areas where we really should be you know, every year looking at multiple things around security and AI and the changing nature of privacy and data. And like, <laughs> there's just a whole, all the infrastructure concerns. And um, they were just very adamant that they felt like we shouldn't stick citizen legislators on this council of experts to, and I, I think Becky captured what I had heard from uh, from the folks from Senate GovOps pretty well. Representative Chase, go ahead. Uh, uh, I, given my experience, um, I would feel comfortable being on this sort of a, a committee, um, but I'm not sure an awful lot of people would uh, particularly care to or, uh, and, and as legislators, we don't have security clearances or anything like that. So some of the topics discussed, There's the smaller the group that holds that information, the more secure it is. I'm, I would rather have us on there, but I don't think it's, I would not advise the, the group go to battle over that particular amendment. <laughs> I appreciate your uh, flexibility and diplomacy on that. <laughs> I would suggest we just, for the heck of it, add put one house member. <laughs> uh, well, I, so I think in this late in the session, my concern about, uh, I, I, I might be inclined if we had another few days actually play that game with the Senate, but um, I also think, you know, in all seriousness, we shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily be composing this because we know we have somebody who has a lot to offer in this vein, you know, designing a council for the next few years based on a particular legislator probably isn't the best practice for us, uh, even though I, I agree absolutely with the spirit of that. And uh, yeah, that that's uh, that one's tough too here. Um, I think there were a few, you were almost done and then we kind of, I, I got us derailed. I apologize, we should at least get through the walkthrough here before we put this aside for the day. Uh, so section two, um, this section in both bills is amending a definition that's already in statute for critical infrastructure. Um, and most of this was, was what was in your version of the bill. What they added uh, to, to this is thermal fuels and systems. And um, section, the new section three in the bill is a report, as I mentioned when I started there is that new definition of essential supply chain. And um, one of the things they would like the council to include in its first annual report that is required under, under this bill is a recommendation on whether to amend that definition of essential supply chain uh, to include any additional supply chains. And that would, you know, and then the legislature could take action to amend statute to do um, that. Um, section four is the repeal section. So this was just section three in your bill. And they, um, they extended the sunset of the council to June 30th, 2028. So they added two years. Um, and then finally the effective date is still July 1st, 2023. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, thank you. Um, I heard the chair say before we were going to hit the pause button on this conversation for a little bit. So I guess we'll free you up to head off. 
All right, welcome back, everybody, to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, we are here this afternoon to take a look at H-517 uh, and an amendment that Tucker has worked on with um, the member from Waterbury. Uh, Chair Stevens is here with us, so I want to welcome you, Tom. Good to see you. Um, and uh, Tucker, would you um, maybe tee this up, and then um, we'll hear from the from Waterbury. Yeah, representing Just a quick procedure question. Are we just doing a walkthrough? Exactly. We're not going to have time to get this through the center. Or am I missing something? So I want to... I'm curious. Yeah. I, I was looking at it going, mm. I uh, want to understand what's going on here at Waterbury, and then I may beg for a possibility for us to move this quickly if we can help the town of Waterbury out. If not, okay. so be it. I'm just curious. I said, man, I don't know. You know so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you. Just going to take a look and see what, see what we can do here. <laughs> okay. A great question because we are in the waning days. So Tucker. Good afternoon, Tucker Nathan, Legislative Council. For the record, page 517, as introduced, has two subsections in it. It is not very dissimilar from some of the other fire district dissolutions that you've dealt with this year, um, with notable exception that I'll get to later. Uh, so initially, subsection A approves the dissolution of what is known as Duxbury Moortown Fire District Number One and memorializes that uh, the voters of the fire district approve the dissolution of the fire district on August 6, 2022. Uh, background for that, uh, I do not have materials to share with the committee that shows what the vote is. I only have uh, minutes from that meeting that indicate that the voters, excuse me, that the fire district is the way that it's phrased, approved the dissolution of the district. And it appears as though there were perhaps four individuals, um, some representing the Prudential Committee, maybe one person who did not represent the Prudential Committee at that meeting. Subsection B states that on the effective date of the act, which is on passage, that the fire district will cease to exist as a political entity or body corporate. Uh, this would be similar to the Rutland Fire District number three that was dissolved six years ago. The exception that that fire district had no assets and no liabilities and no infrastructure and for all purposes only existed legally, did not exist physically. This is different. And typically, when you have assets, liabilities, and infrastructure, that has to get transferred to some other corporation, which is why there's an amendment uh, that is posted on the committee's page to add a subsection C that would transfer assets, liabilities, property, and claims from the fire district to the Edward Farrar Utility District, pursuant to the vote that was held on August 6, 2022. And the minutes reflect that that was a component of the annual meeting of the fire district it was the transfer of those things to the EFUD, as it's affectionately referred to within these halls. The second sentence states that the EFUD will have authority to collect any debts or other amounts due that have resulted from services provided to customers of the fire district. Why is that sentence in there? Well, because since 2013, it appears as though uh, first the village of Waterbury and then after the 2017 charter enactment, the EFUD has been operating these water services within the fire district uh, and continue to operate water services within the fire district after the fire district voted to dissolve and walk away which is potentially where the issues that come to your attention start. Uh, you'll recall from your time with the Colchester dissolutions over both this session and last biennium um, that usually there is an agreement executed between the corporations for the transfer of assets. Usually you get some idea formally of what the boundaries and the water lines are. And typically the transfer is between, at least in the most recent cases, municipal entity and a regional entity. Um, in this case, some background that you should know about the legal structure of the EFUD is that the EFUD is an incorporated utility district that has its own charter, 
the voters of the EFUD are restricted to those who live within the EFUD's boundaries within the town of Waterbury. Uh, the commissioners of the EFUD have rate setting authority, which is not dissimilar. However, an issue that this committee has dealt with in the past is that the EFUD is one of those water districts that sets extraterritorial rates, which is different from the water districts you've dealt with over the past to Biennia, where the rate setting is uniform throughout the district and all of the member municipalities have voting rights. So that is one thing that is going to be unique about the transfer here from Duxbury Moortown to the EFUD is that uh, the fire district has transferred assets, liabilities, and legal authority, and those customers will no longer have voting rights within the municipality that's going to be um, offering them water services. Representative. Tucker, you know, it talks about and see all assets, liabilities, and property. I mean, should there, does there need to be things tightened up there as far as adding maybe uh, operational duties, or is that just a given once it goes over to that? That will be a given. And important to note, one question that I had, and I did some research in the 2017 Act that I was one of the first bills that I worked on with Legislative Council was the formation of the EFUD uh, and the EFUD Charter. Um, even when the village transitioned to Edward Fire Utility District, they didn't include anything in their transitional provisions about the operating agreements carrying over. And the operating agreement that is currently being relied upon with Duxbury Moortown Fire District Number One is with the Village of Waterbury. At least that's the copy that I got. It is not with the Edward Farrar Utility District. So legally, I think it's assumed that once an entity has possession of the infrastructure and the legal authority to apply the rates, that they also take operational control. Um, I'm seeing Mr. Leitz, who is the town administrator, uh, nodding his head. So, Tucker, anything else you want to tell us about the words on the page? And then maybe we can have a conversation, uh, take some testimony from Tom. Thank you very much, Tucker. So, Mr. Leitz, uh, good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, sorry, sorry for the last question. Um, so, just uh, the village, but actually has an agreement with the fire district dating back to the 90s, um, where we've essentially operated as ours for that period of time. There were, there were conversations uh, before my time here. I joined here late last year, but there were conversations in the spring and summer of 2022 about combining. Um, and when I started, uh, that was still a conversation, and I was I intended to take that up this year. Um, the, the fire district's vote to dissolve was not something that anyone here was aware of. Um, and then late in 2022, the, the chairman of the fire district walked into town hall with a check for the assets and said, we dissolved, it's all yours. And he essentially walked away from it. Um, at first, we weren't even sure what to do with the check. We eventually created a separate bank account, and there it sits. Um, and we've operated as if it is ours. but. Uh, and speaking to our council, some of the basic things about operating a water system are we cannot do. For instance, if we've got delinquent accounts, we have no ability to uh, shut off water. We have no ability to conduct a tax sale. So there's a need to uh, combine the two. Um, and it was the full intent, I think, of both uh, EFUD and the fire district to combine. But we just did not expect them to, uh, in essence, vote to dissolve and and not be an active part of the process. So here we are. Representative Higley, go ahead. Uh, yeah, could you speak to uh, the voting uh, decision that, that is made? I, I didn't quite understand that from what Tucker had said. It sounds like folks aren't gonna have a, a vote that are in that water district. Um, are you talking about the vote to dissolve the district that they held? No, I mean going forward. So going forward, um, as the bill is written, only 
uh, in essence, the only people who can vote um, at EFUD's annual meeting, which incidentally is tonight, are uh, residents of what is essentially the old village of Waterbury. So we have town customers who don't who don't vote at our annual meeting, and then the Dutsbury Moortown Fire District customers, once absorbed, would also not vote. So I think that's pretty a pretty common relationship, uh, exactly the same as St Albans City and St Albans Town, where just city residents. Uh, have a vote on, on utility related matters. So I think the, the question that Representative Higley might really be asking is the voters of the uh, Duxbury Moortown fire district did not vote to dissolve their fire districts and merge with the EFUD or sort of get services from the, the EFUD, right? I mean, it's it's sort of like they're, they're uh, it's the uh, credential committee got together and, and voted to dissolve um, and not knowing if they have bylaws that allow them to take that kind of action without a vote. That's our question, I guess. Yeah. And, and the advice of our council was that only the legislature can dissolve a fire district. So that's true, but we usually do it um, as because, of, you know, we, we uh, as our legislative council has reminded us many times, we breathe life into these municipal corporations and then, you know, we can dissolve them when it's uh, when they've gone past their usefulness. Um, but we usually do that uh, as a result of a public vote, um, except for, you know, I can think of like, for instance, the. Uh, this was kind of, it's kind of similar in well in Colchester they had a vote mm -hmm. so that's that's the only thing that's unusual about this I mean when was is there any historical information about sort of the creation of the Duxbury Moortown Fire District and whether the the uh, Prudential Committee had the ability to to dissolve it the way that they did that's really unusual. <laughs> none at my fingertips uh, your council may have that and speaking with the uh, who was the gentleman who was the chair of the credential committee, um, they struggled to have a quorum for years or to have public involvement. And it's a pretty small district, it's about 140 customers. And they held their vote at the time they did because he was actually leaving the district. So they wanted to, in their minds, hold a legal vote while they still had a quorum. So there was some, there was some logic to their process, even if it wasn't technically correct. Okay, uh, so the the reality now is that the Duxbury Moortown Fire District Number One it is an extra -ter territorial service area of EFA. Correct. And the reality is, we are operating it. We will continue to do so. If there's a a waterline break, we will out there. We will repair it immediately. We will continue to bill as we have. We're simply not going to abandon those customers. Um, but my understanding is there's, uh, in essence, no government representation on their side of the table. Representative Tango. Thank you. Um, um, re sort of referred to the situation in St. Albans, and I'm not super familiar with it. You must be. Is this the same situation as the sewer? issue in St. Albans, which is really contentious. Yeah, it's not the same. So, uh, Tom, you may be able to, to speak to this at length. Um, but what I would say is that the reason it's so contentious or was before the, the recent meeting of the grand bargain that was struck uh, very recently. God, uh, thanks, Tom, for all of your help leading us up to that, because there's <laughs> a lot more love between the city and the town of St. Albans now. Yeah. Um, so the um, the issue there was that the city owned the, the water, had invested in it, and um, that the, the town uh, was an extraterritorial user. Um, but in order to get access to new hookups, the city wanted to charge an affiliation fee uh, to new uh, customers. And so I don't think any of the affiliation fee that was really the thing that was causing all the problems exists here. Um, the, the thing that is similar is that you have one municipality that owns the infrastructure, provides the service, and it is providing that infrastructure to, uh, for a differential rate 
to fund the water service, I think, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, to those other um, municipalities or, you know, to customers in other municipalities. Entirely correct. There's about a 5% rate differential. So none of, none of the horrible affiliation fee uh, debacle in Waterbury, Moortown, Duxbury area? <laughs> not, not yet. Okay, Representative Pickley. Well, I think to me, it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, the North Sea Kingdom Solid Waste Management District that had a provision in it where in a certain period of time for all the towns to, you know, vote against what uh, the uh, commission did, in a sense, and they chose not to, so it went through. But at least there was an opportunity, a very small window maybe, but an opportunity for those towns to speak out. Um. Is there anybody representing? So I, I, I see that uh, reps from Moortown and Duxbury are co-sponsors of H five seventeen. So I take it that the that those communities are interested in doing away with this fire district as well. Um, Representative Stevens, would you like to? Yeah, would you mind uh, getting in on the conversation here? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury Village, or I'm sorry, EFA. <laughs> it's not short, but, um, and I'm not sure, Tom, if I'm going to be able to vote today um, in the EFA uh, vote. So, just to give you a quick idea of what where we're talking about, if you if you've been in Waterbury Village and you're heading down towards Montpelier. You end up going over a bridge where Snowfire Auto is and, and where there's a gymnasium and, and whatnot. That's actually more town. And we're talking about 100 and what you say, Tom, 140 customers. <clears throat> so we're talking about a corner of Duxbury and more town area, which may fit in the 05676 zip code or whatever. It's just an area that because we're adjacent and been adjacent to it, um, when they form the fire, they form the fire district to become the customer. So that they can have water service, uh, they don't get sewer service, that or else they would be part of the village. Um, I don't know how long it's been in effect, but it's been for some time. And like a like a small municipality, which they are, the same people ran them for many years. And I think that the um, the element that we're talking about is is people may have felt that they could just close it down. And as Tom mentioned, bring a check to the, to the town office and say, here's the balance of what we have and please take care of our residents. And so these residents would turn into individual customers much the same way that Waterbury, where the EFUD sells it to other members in Waterbury who are not in the, um, what used to be the village. Now is determined where the sewer went. So anybody outside of the village doesn't have town sewer service. Um, the representatives from Moore Town and Duxbury did, they were the primary sponsors on this at first because, um, but I don't have any information as to who came to them except to say that this was an issue. Obviously it's important to keep water flowing to people. Um, Tom, does the district go as far as the landfill? I believe so. Yeah, so the, the old Moortown landfill is, you know, it, the cause for having fresh water was solved or, you know, when they formed the district. And so now, again, I, I have no further information about what the voting um, situation was, but it's definitely, it was definitely a municipality that was not running at full steam. Um, and that's why they... I believe that would be the, the, the motivation for closing it down, that they didn't do it according to whatever their bylaws may be is the issue here. Yeah, so we're essentially, it sounds like we're talking about a completely defunct municipality that serves 140 water customers just over the Waterbury line in more town in Duxbury. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I guess my next question would be, 
given that we're in the last couple of days of the session, what is the, the risk of us taking up and sort of trying to wrap this next year versus trying to pull off some kind of very challenging rule suspension procedural maneuver, which would definitely cause a case uh, between both bodies uh, this year. So uh, is there a case to be made why, why there's urgency here? The case I can make is there's uh, a few larger customers with pretty substantial delinquencies. And as it stands now, we have no real ability to collect. Um, in our operational agreement with the district, um, because they own the lines, they've got that legal authority to actually perform a shutoff or to conduct a tax sale. As I understand it, we do not. Um, and so that creates a bit of a financial challenge for us. Um, and the problem is unlikely to get better if we wait a year. It's not 140 customers, it's a handful of customers, just like any utility district, but it is nonetheless a challenge for us. And one of the customers is the middle school. But we will continue to operate the system as we have, we'll continue to make sure the infrastructure works appropriately for everyone, if you wait. Say that again, Representative. I'm sorry, um, and Tom, I started to interrupt you, I apologize. Um, the district also includes the middle school. Um, just not that that's not that that's the biggest customer or anything. They have paid their bill. That's Duxbury. And we also have uh, customers on occasion who want to connect. Uh, that obviously can't happen. Uh, oh, so you could, really couldn't make a new connection. In terms of whenever the session for this time being closes, we're not ending the session. We are ostensibly, not officially, but I assume we're going to have to come back in June for various, for one or two various reasons. Would business otherwise be done? So it's entirely possible to do this half and then do the other half later. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you're, uh, I believe for something like this, uh, the answer is probably yes. Uh, we've had some conversations in our committee unrelated to this, so that, that might be a sore spot. We've <laughs> just rubbed a little bit. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you taking this up. Um, I, it, this was not on my front burner, though, I knew that the representatives from from Moore Town and, and uh, Duxbury were, were bringing this forward. And um, again, it sounds like it's a situation that the, the sooner the EFUD, if there is a quote unquote easy way with Tucker's language to become owners of this, the whole system, the mechanics of the system, that would be beneficial. Otherwise, it'll be tape and duct tape till we, until we come back next year. And I don't know what it means financially. Um, I mean, th those payments will pile up and the owners will have to pay them eventually, but um, obviously. All right, committee. Uh, <laughs> We've talked about a lot of things today, so we're all getting a, a little bit punchy. Um, thank you, Tom. Tom. Um, any, anything else we should know? <laughs> this is Waterbury. Saying Waterbury. <laughs> yeah, so, sounds like uh, this this fire district was kind of an orphan, uh, and and its its last remaining people just sort of said, "Here you go, deal with it, you, you fun." <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of something like this happening. I think, you know, when we've had long conversations about merger, I still get PTSD when I hear that Linden and Lindenville get to merge and Waterbury and Waterbury Village never did. Um, <laughs> we created an EFUD instead. Yeah. And, um, but I, I do, um, in the time that I was on the select board and afterwards, I don't think I've ever heard of a fire district just bugging out like this. And um, it's a unique situation to deal with at the end of the year, and I appreciate it any time <laughs> that you're able to spend on it. Thank you, Representative Stevens. Uh, so, committee. Uh, Thanks, Tom. I, I especially look to uh, my 
longer tenure gut ops veterans for your opinions on what to do in this very unusual situation? Well, um, again, something like this, I don't think that we would object to suspending rules and moving So we want to attempt that. I'd say let's go for it. All right. I, I think uh, helping out Mr. Lates and uh, making sure that the water can keep flowing, especially to the Cross of Brook Middle School, is uh, important. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why that's here right now. So I would enter. I would well, <laughs> you just go on for the ride. We're, gonna do <laughs> we're, we're talking about 140 water customers in uh, more town than Duxbury. <laughs> and some that want to be. And some, and maybe some that want to be. Um, Stay right so right I would, uh, I would entertain a motion um, to accept uh, as favorable uh, H517 when amended by draft uh, 1.1. Make the motion. Representative Nugent has moved that we um, yes, support we H5171 amended by draft number 1.1. I got the draft right. There's not, there's not a 1.2 out there. Okay. I'm just double checking. It's There's been a lot today. All right. Um, so, uh, any other discussion? When the clerk is ready, uh, would she call the roll? <clears throat> uh, Representative Byron. Yes. Representative Boyden. Yes. Representative Hingo. Yes. Representative Morgan? Yes. Representative Cooper of Burlington? Yeah. Representative Markey? Yes. Representative Chase? Yes. Representative Waters Evans? Yes. Representative Cooper of Randolph? Representative Nugent? Yes. Representative Higley? Yes. Representative McCarthy? Yes. 11 0 1. Did you want me to report this? Sure. <laughs> I really deeply appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Representative Higley has. We agreed to be the reporter of this bill. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, Tom, thank you. Uh, we will do our best to move this along as expeditiously as we can. Um, great. Um, <laughs> have a good one. Good to see you again. All right, everybody. Uh, we're due back up on the floor, so we'll adjourn and go off live. See you up there.